So what would we do if we suddenly had 3,000 new members? Would we be thrilled? Would we consider a building project? Would we see the Spirit of God at work among us? Or would we just think, oh, that church is just not like what I remember it used to be. It's just not the same anymore. What would we do if we suddenly had 3,000 new members? Well, according to our scripture lesson today, that was the reality of the very first congregation that, had, that were still together 50, 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead. 50 days after, G, after Resurrection Day is the day that we still celebrate as a Christian body, and we call it Pentecost. This year it's going to be June 8th. It moves around with Easter. And Pentecost is a Jewish holiday, and... It's a time when people gather in Jerusalem for a festival. It's not as big as Passover is, but it's one of their festivals. And as we read the book of Acts, the book that comes uh, in the Bible, Luke, Luke wrote both Luke and Acts, so it's his second book. And after he talks about Jesus' resurrection, he talks about what happened to the first Christians. And so in Acts 1, he talks about how Jesus ascended into heaven and how the disciples worked together to pick a new 12th disciple to replace Judas and how they were instructed to stay in Jerusalem. And 50 days after Resurrection Day, something tremendous happened. A, a spirit that was like a wind and tongues of fire came and, and touched each of the 12 disciples, apostles, and they ran out into the street telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. And they were able to say it in, in languages that all the foreigners that were there could hear in their own native language, the Tower of Babel in reverse. And people were amazed and astonished what was happening. But some of the people there thought that, that these men from Galilee were just filled with new wine and therefore diminished what was going on. So that's when Peter got up and gave this sermon. Remember Peter, the guy 53 days before who had denied Jesus three times on, when Jesus was in trial and then hid on crucifixion day? But Peter had experienced the resurrection and now the coming of the Holy Spirit. And he stood up boldly and gave this sermon that you heard part of this morning about what God was doing and how Jesus was the one that was coming from God. And when, as you heard, when people said, What shall we do, brothers? He said, Repent and be baptized. And 3,000 people stepped forward and were baptized and became part of the Jesus way. Now that's Billy Graham, let's fill the stadium for altar call kind of experience, isn't it? We're just not accustomed to that. And as I read the, the rest of the book of Acts, I get, a little, I, I, I get a little sense that maybe that number was inflated a little bit based on the dynamics that are happening a little later on. But even if you like lop, lop off a zero and 300 people stepped up, that would have quadrupled their size. Because up, up at that point, Acts chapter 1 says that there was 120 of them. And so the point is, that because of Pentecost, the day of the Holy Spirit, the followers of, of Jesus were inspired and to go out and tell the good news of Jesus until more and more people became followers of this movement called the Way. And that way began to grow around the Mediterranean world and then later gr grew into Europe and then into Africa and then into Asia. So that today there's over a billion people who call themselves Christians or followers of the way. And we celebrate that good news spirit that we call Pentecost. Well, my observation is that as congregationalists and progressive Christians, we don't have such high expectations. We've, we've become accustomed not to take in such large numbers so that we, we don't expect to take in large groups of people. And, and as I think about what it means to be a congregationalist, a member of the United Church of Christ, if you're a congregationalist, 
We're, we've always thought of ourselves as the established church, especially in New England. So we've got out of the habit of inviting people to be part of us. As a matter of fact, as I study our history, sometimes we got a little snooty and just kind of invited certain people to be part of us because we were the church to belong to. Well, as Reverend Barber explained to us last week, we need to start thinking of ourselves not so much as a church but as a movement. Because as you think about it, for everybody who's under 60 now, they either never went to church or left the church a long time ago. And for those under 35, church is that institution that you just kind of don't want to be part of and just have misconceptions of what it means. We have one of the young adults of our church that was telling me a story last weekend about how her 19-year-old sister was surprised that she still went to church because our church member is a neurobiologist, a neuroscientist. And so the sister says, well, you're a scientist. Do you believe in evolution? Well, of course our church member does. But there are those Christians who don't, and so there are people who don't go to churches assume all Christians don't believe in evolution. We have a different way. We have a story to tell. We're invited to be invitational because evangelism, church growth is just as important to the life of our, of our church as Christian education and worship and music ministry and youth ministry and children's ministry and outreach ministry and justice ministry. It's all part of the package. And we're all invited to be part of that and make it part of our church of our life. Now, I've discovered over the years that every time I, t- I talk about evangelism with a congregation, the people in the pew get a little... Sweat, sweaty. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know if I, where, where this is going <laughs> and what this means for me. And so, over the years, I've kind of learned a way to help people to talk about their faith. Because one of the things that we say as, as United Church of Christ people is that we're very tolerant of other people, you know, that... You know, we feel like we have a way that finds God, but we're very appreciative of other ways and, and want to be in dialogue. And so we, we've been a little shell-shocked and want to talk about what we believe and, and not to offend anybody. But I, I've, I've found a way that we can talk about our church and our faith that still enlists a conversation and allows people to hear our story. And I'm going to do that with an illustration. It's kind of long, but I, I think you'll get the point at the end. So a year ago, this last week, my father passed away. And my father lived in southern Illinois near St. Louis in a town that he lived in all his life. And so we all gathered there um, for, the, for the funeral service and uh, to be together. And like all families, we told stories about our dad to celebrate his life. And one of the stories that my youngest sister told who had taken over my dad's affairs the last few years of his life, his financial affairs and medical affairs, et cetera, was whenever she called, because she lived in Minneapolis and my dad lived in Southern Illinois, and she said, I'd call him up and I'd say, what am I supposed to do with this? And he'd say, call this guy. And she said, my dad always had this guy to talk to, whatever the situation was. So, like, for example, when the decision was made to sell his car, she said, what should I do with your car? And he said, well, call down the south side garage and talk to this guy. And so she called down there, and she got the receptionist, and she said, well, I'm calling about uh, selling my dad's car. And the receptionist said, oh, we don't do that. And she said, well, my father, Virgil Zolzer, asked me to call and said, maybe you could help us out. Oh, she said, oh, sure, Virgil. We'll get back to you. In <laughs> that afternoon, one of the owners of the, of the garage called and said, I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and in about a week, the car was sold. So we were having the funeral lunch after the service for my dad, and, and the, 
the kids and my three, two sisters and myself were talking about my dad's things. He, they had a storage locker of furniture and some other things that needed to be disposed of, and none of us lived around there anymore. And we were a little concerned about what we were going to manage all this. And then the son of one of my dad's friends came up and said, I understand you're trying to dispose of some of your, your father's furniture. And we said, yeah. And he says, I know this guy. And so I called this guy up, and he knew my dad, and he said, sure, we can help you out. And he met me down at the storage locker, and we looked over the things, and said, yeah, no problem. He had an auction house. And so he made arrangements to bring a truck back and load up all the stuff and take us to his auction house and have an estate sale for my father. And it all got settled very smoothly, just because my dad knew these guys. <laughs> well, I've discovered that Women have networks. Men have guys. <laughs> so my illustration might be more for the guys, but we'll see here. So what I'd like to invite you to do is that, you know, when you're out and about and, and with people, you might start talking about how great your church is and about some of the things you, that goes on there and some of the things you appreciate about your congregation. And, of course, you're going to talk about how great your ministers are, Right? And, and then you'll say, you know, down at my church, they talk about this guy named Jesus. And Jesus, this guy named Jesus talks about love and grace and peace and hope and love. And I've discovered by following this guy that I'm more hopeful and I'm more graceful and I'm more cheerful and I'm more complete and I'm more, more connected to God because of this guy named Jesus. In fact... When it comes to faith and spirituality, he's my guy. So that might be a conversation that you have with people. See, I think the church is invited to inspire people to a richer and deeper life. And we've, we've come to a place in our society where people aren't, aren't sure about that anymore because they hear so many different messages about what it means to be a Christian. And all we can do is to tell our message, our message of hope and love and peace and grace and justice and invite people to grow with us and to walk with us and find the power of God in their life. A little over 100 years ago now, there was a shoe company in New York City that wanted to expand their market. So they sent two salesmen to Brazil. Now, remember, this was back before World War I. And about a month later, one of the, one of the salesmen cabled back to New York City and said, nobody wears shoes here. I want to go home. But at the same time, the other salesman cabled back Nobody wears shoes here. Send more order forms. See, it's all about perspective. It's all about what we have to say. And even though it's a harder market, we too are inspired to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to preach and teach and to love and to share God's grace. That's the power of our church. And that's the power of the movement that we call being part of the Christian way. So let us continue to walk on that way. Amen.